and welcome to the Two Wheel Revolution here on ThinkTech dot ThinkTechHawaii.com. I'm Peter Rossig, I'm your host, and we have a very interesting guest today, uh, uh, somebody connected to Hawaii but not in Hawaii, which we'll explain a little bit later. Uh, stick around. Okay, thank you. Hello. Aloha and welcome to the Two Wheel Revolution. I'm Peter Rossig, your host. With me today is a guest, Gabriel Shear, who is with Ele Elemental Accelerator, which uh, I'm sure many of my half a dozen dedicated viewers know uh, somewhat, but we're going to learn a lot more about it. If I were a religious person, I'd take note of the fact that we have a Peter and a Gabriel on the same show. So if you hear trumpets or uh, see the pearly gates, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Not to worry. Anyway, Gabriel, welcome to uh, to the Two Wheel Revolution. Thank you. And here I thought with Peter Gabriel, you'd take it down a 1980s rock riff. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm I'm too old for that. No, no, that's a good point. We could have gone a different we could have gone a different route. I met Gabriel uh, last September at the uh, Micro Mobility America conference in San Francisco. He was on, I think, two, maybe uh, maybe just one. He was on panels talking about this very subject that we're uh, we're dealing with today, the micro mobility and uh, the future uh, of it, because he's director of innovation for LML Accelerator. So to start, Gabriel, uh, most people, many people know LML Accelerator, think of it as something that's happening only here in Hawaii. Tell us a little bit about LML Accelerator and then about your role in it. Happy to. Yeah, Elemental is an accelerator, as the name implies, started in 2009 in Honolulu and has now, I would say, broadened to be a global global entity or a global actor. Uh, but the, the sort of mission remains the same, which is elevating climate tech companies and founders with a particular interest in underserved founders, underrepresented founders and then frontline communities. And we're fortunate to have been able to invest significantly over the years in companies in Hawaii or projects in Hawaii, but also now operate in the mainland US, in Europe, in APAC, and in uh, Africa and India now as well. Wow, that's that's interesting. And so many things that happen in Hawaii are actually better known outside of Hawaii than they are here at home uh, and uh, have a reach that I think few people around here really appreciate. So uh, what is the director of innovation and uh, what what do you do? Sure. Uh, Director of innovation in the elemental context means I get to work with our founders and our companies, and I also get to find the next wave of founders and companies with whom we'll be working. Uh, for me, it's a really privileged position because we have, you know, since the beginning invested in something like 150 companies, and we keep those companies very active, uh, very engaged with each other and with us. And, you know, in many cases with Hawaii, trying to bring them back to Hawaii or engage them with Hawaii. And I get to work with a lot of those founders. In particular, in my case, I work on the mobility and energy portfolio. So companies that fall under those two categories fall into, into my work stream, as it were. And i really excited because I get to talk to a lot of amazing people trying to solve really big problems and make life better for a lot of folks. Okay. So just briefly tell us your background and how you came to be, uh, be in this position. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've mostly played on the entrepreneur or operator side for most of my career. I've started a couple of companies of my own. I've worked in mobility a lot and in energy significantly as well. Mm -hmm. uh, on the mobility side, some folks in Hawaii may recall a very short-lived presence of a scooter and bike share company called Lime. Uh, I was not a part of that remember. I, I know. Uh, <laughs> I was not a part of that launch, but I was a part of that company. In fact, I was on the founding team, and so I got to help build the company. Uh, and actually got to work in Hawaii afterwards, after the launch, after that all sort of happened to try to fix what had, you know, frankly, not gone very well. And so I worked both at the city and county level as well as at the legislative level uh, to work on micromobility more broadly and Lime specifically. Uh, after I left Lime, I also worked with a couple of other companies like them, a company called Super Pedestrian and another called Spin. And ultimately, it was also consulting with a company called Drone Seed, which does reforestation using heavy lift drone swarms. They've actually rebranded recently to Mast Reforestation. But through them, I found Elemental and was made aware of just this incredible work that this group was doing in the community from which it had sprung. And um, yeah, found my way to Elemental through that. Interesting. Since you mentioned Super Pedestrian, uh, I've also had some some contact with them. They're they're a pretty amazing group. It, 
came out of MIT, and uh, they have a pretty uh, nice scooter that they're trying to actually, as I understand it, trying to get uh, into Honolulu and uh, get civic permission to, uh, you know, jump the lime hurdle and, and uh, get started here. Tell us a little bit more about that one, if you could. Yeah, I mean, Super Pedestrian, as you said, started as a bunch of engineers out of MIT. The thing that's, I think, the starting point where many people know them, especially in the bike community, is they actually created their first product as a smart bicycle wheel. Uh, so right. it was an electric wheel. You just add it to any old bike, and suddenly yeah. it was an electric bike. Uh, they, they saw what was happening with scooters in the early days with Lime and Bird and others and thought, oh, we could do that and we could probably build a little bit better one. And, you know, subjective opinions on that, but uh, they certainly built a very good one. And now are an operator. They operate across numerous cities in North America and Europe. And yeah, I, I can't speak to whether or not they're engaged in Hawaii, but I can say that it would be an obvious place for them to be talking. Yeah, well, uh, I can say that they are uh, talking to the city and county and, uh, of Honolulu and uh, University of Hawaii, which would be a great test bed for uh, for trying out super pedestrian or other scooters. There are a lot of scooters already on campus. Uh, Lime seems to have made uh, uh, somewhat of a comeback from its uh, depths, I guess. The uh, head of Lime spoke <laughs> at the conference, which we were both at, and uh, he seemed like uh, A, smart, and B, aggressive, and, and uh, trying to get Lime back uh, into the game. Uh, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think Wayne's done a great job since taking over, I guess, two-ish years ago. Mm -hmm. the, you know, recently it was announced that Lime was revenue positive last year, first time that that's happened, and, and wow. that was EBITDA, not just EBIT. So um, obviously there are lots of ways to calculate profitability and revenue and so forth, especially when it comes to tech startups and mobility startups. but. I think that the biggest sort of headline out of all of that is there is a path. And I think that the you know companies have been around long enough now. Lime, we found it in January 2017. So it's a six-year-old company at this point. And I think after that, that period of time, you've gone through a lot of lessons. And some of those lessons are harder than others. But hopefully they and many of their competitors, frankly, have figured out how to make this thing profitable. I think, you know, candidly, the world needs them to figure it out. So it is my hope and my belief that they're probably on that track. Yeah. I mean, our 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 stake in the success of these companies is that it's a very good form of transportation for some people in some some circumstances, obviously. Uh, not everybody's not going to be on a scooter, obviously. But uh, that, for example, on the University of Hawaii campus, there, there are already scooters. Beaky, the local bike share, has some stations up there. And it would seem to be a natural for a, a kind of uh, you know, as I said, for a test bed up there. Um, yeah. So uh, we got to hope think, somebody makes it. Uh, yeah, agreed. And I think one of the things that's worth noting is most of the companies who have really grown, Lime, a number of the other ones, are multimodal as well. So it's not just scooters. For example, Lime, you know, I live in Seattle. We operate here, or not we, Lime operates here, a fleet of both scooters and electric bikes. Mm -hmm. And the bikes are amazing. Uh, Lyft is also operating bikes. I know Spin has announced them. I don't know that they're operating in many markets right now. Uh, VO is operating a bike-like object that you can use. Uh, there's some really interesting form factor innovation or innovation in the style of vehicle. And I think that's going to be a key, too, is to your point, a scooter doesn't serve every use for every person. Right. For example, if I've got a purse or a child or groceries or whatever, a scooter is all of the above. Right. Right. Um, yeah. But, a, you know, a two seater bike with cargo capacity suddenly fixes a lot of those problems. So I think it's going to be interesting to continue to see what people roll out. So that brings us to to very neatly to the, the innovation uh, question. And that is kind of what do you what do you see or what are you looking for in, in terms of this kind of. Uh, I say two wheel, but of course there's one wheel, there's three wheels, there's uh, the those little uh, moonwalkers have eight little wheels. But the general idea is personal mobility, uh, usually electric. We also include bikes, of course, uh, regular traditional bikes, which have always been, it seems to me, uh, first bikes came here in 1869 and here, here in Hawaii looked it up. And, uh, you know, they've always been an innovative thing because people could build their own and people could uh, redesign their own. And they've always been incredible uh, custom made bicycles. So it's an area that seems to me is just rife. You know, you you and I can't probably go into the our, our garage and create a, a Tesla. Uh, but 
you know, we could go into our garage and probably take a frame from here and some Shimano this and so forth and, and build a bike and even an electric bike. So uh, and, and, and innovate in this area. So what do you see coming? What do you see happening? I see the happening part being a lot of innovation. And if you look at even just the, the companies I just mentioned, Lime, Vio, et cetera, they're innovating rapidly to figure out what are the things that will solve more problems. Um, we're seeing a lot of interesting innovation out of Europe in particular. There is a company in Elementals portfolio, one that we, we support called Nuveal. They do electric cargo trailers. The really cool thing about these cargo trailers is imagine your standard bicycle that you just hack together with a frame and some parts. Uh, <laughs> but you want to carry a large amount of load. They've built a trailer that is itself electric. You attach it with a very small bracket and pin adjustment to the bike, and then you start riding, and you can carry a couple hundred kilos worth of weight on the back of that and wow. not notice it at all. And the amazing thing is, imagine climbing up to you know the U of H or something like that. You've got a hill. You're going down that hill. You hit the brakes. The trailer stops itself. So it's an incredible innovation there. And so super excited about that. They've got partnerships in Europe with IKEA, with a number of postal services and others for delivery of things. Uh, I think delivery of things is an area that's seeing a lot of innovation. There's also three-wheeled, four-wheeled little things that look kind of like a bike, kind of like a car. We're seeing a lot of blending uh, of, of those things. And I think as cities increasingly restrict or reduce the amount of space available for cars, uh, that, that means both driving, so lanes, but also parking, we're going to see more innovation on those type of form factors. I mean, the reality is that cars, trucks, et cetera, are very useful for certain things but are overbuilt and unnecessary for other things. And so there are trips where it will make sense to just jump on a cargo bike, or if you need a seated device, sit on a seated trike of some sort that's electric. Uh, there's actually just an article about electric trikes being a new thing for aging boomers, and they can now get around, you know, it's brilliant, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Same with, same with golf carts. I mean, you see a lot of innovation happening around that edge of like, how do we actually downsize a little bit? And I think the innovation that we're seeing is happening in some places more than others, in part because the existing urban form makes it work better, the existing behavioral norms, and then ultimately policy. Yeah, yeah. Those are the kind of the three things that got got to work together, right? You've got to mm -hmm. have the the uh, the policies in place, but you've got to have the the urban environment and you've got to have the uh the, the people that'll that'll jump on it and, and are willing yep. willing to try it. Is that are those the three quick things that you'd look for if you're hoping for success? That's a pretty good, succinct summary, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I, willingness to try things is obviously key, but you've always got reasons or ways to get people to start trying things when it's an interesting new toy. I mean, that's one of the things we saw with scooters at the beginning was yeah. it was something that a lot of people associated with fun. It took little effort and it was relatively easy to learn. And so right. for a lot of people, it was something they could just jump on and try this out. Candidly, Lime's time in Hawaii, while it was only four or five days, the usage was incredibly high. And I attribute a lot of that to just, it's interesting and fun. It's a new thing. And I think we'll see that. The policy side to me is maybe the biggest hoop to, to hurdle, it, as it were, on the three that you mentioned, right. simply because it takes time and effort and, and there's always an entrenched opposition to any kind of policy change. And it just takes a lot of work. Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to have a, the uh, Department of Transportation Services a deputy director on the show in the future here. And, uh, you know, one of the things I got to ask him is, how do you get the mentality of people who have essentially uh, grown, you know, gone to school, grown up and learned how to do streets and, and you know, buses to a certain extent? Uh, how do you get them to start thinking about these other kinds of vehicles and fitting them into their their sense of what what a, a cityscape should look like? Uh, that's got to be, and and you know, you get into the legalities. Obviously, the insurance question. The say, uh, you know, there there's understandably a lot of a lot of hurdles. But I think the first thing's really got to be the mindset of the people who are going to help us jump those hurdles. Yeah, I mean, you do have. It's interesting. There are lots of different angles you can take too. When you think about parking, for example, there are an increasing number of cities and states saying we're going to get rid of parking minimums. Uh, you know, and required numbers of units or parking spaces rather per unit of, of housing or whatever on the property. That is one tool, right? That's one way to start changing behaviors. And that's a private sector tool to some degree in the sense that by the government saying we're not going to require X anymore. Now it's up to the private sector to say, well, what's the market demand? What can we actually pay back on this? And, you know, urban parking space underground on the mainland could cost anywhere from 50 to $100,000 per space. Right. So if I'm a developer and I'm looking at going X number of levels deep, you know, at what point does it stop making sense to do that? Which means now parking is more scarce, et cetera. 
you know, this is the kind of thing that I think we'll increasingly look at. We need more housing. That's clear everywhere. We've got so many challenges with housing that I think that will force some of these conversations to happen from a different angle. You know, you'll have housing developers and others looking at it and saying, maybe we need to rethink this land use stuff. And then, of course, you've got the street side, which is, to your point, DTS or, or DOTs across the, the country and the world who need to figure that out. And ultimately, political leadership, politics right. takes takes front seat. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Get, getting back again, University of Hawaii, I understand the uh, the new commuter, they call it commuter services, a director there is looking to reduce the number of parking spots on the upper campus, which are already, uh, you know, like like uh, four leaf clovers. You gotta, you know, they, they're they're rare as it is, but they want to reduce that. They want to have more pedestrian uh, uh, ways and so forth. And and it, so I think uh, there, as I said, they already have Beaky on campus, and I think they're going to be looking at at scooters because there are private scooters all over the place already, and. And, uh, you know, a bunch of 18 to 22 year olds are the perfect riders <laughs> if you can get them to stay in the lane. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, that's very interesting. And it's not just above, below ground. Above ground parking is uh, ridiculously expensive to build and, and especially in the urban core. Speaking of the urban core, is there anything that you see for this more for the suburbs or more for you know, rural areas in this in this micro mobility movement. Uh, I, I just saw an article that said the Amish are big fans of electric bikes, which, you know, kind of blows your mind a little bit because uh, but it turns out that not all the, uh, you know, the Amish have pick and choose with they like the technology and it's electric. All of a sudden, somehow it, it gets uh, it, it's permissible. Uh, and there were some hilarious photos of, of the guys in the Amish uh, outfits uh, riding along on electric bicycles. So, you know, even in rural areas, uh, it seems like there are possibilities. Uh, wh what do you see happening in that way? Yeah, I think so. I think that there are a few things that happen. One is e-bikes, again, and the increasing strength and power of batteries are such that they, in they increase distance, right? You can imagine living a little further out and still having access to mobility if you have an electric bike, trike, cargo bike, you name it. There are lots of options there that I think help. I also think, like I said earlier, smaller electric cars, whether it's, you know, the biggest biggest selling electric car in China is not a Tesla. It's actually a tiny little, you know, very, very small car the size of a golf cart. And I, I wow. yes, yes, that's China. It's different. But I don't think that those lessons are not applicable here. I think that we can see a lot of stuff happening. When you look at somewhere like Hawaii, in many cases, you have many communities for whom, you know, mobility is very localized. Uh, and you can imagine many of your daily needs being served by one of these smaller form factor vehicles. And maybe you still have the pickup truck to take the surfboard and the family and all that out to the beach on yeah. the weekend. But, but the reality is for most trips, most days, maybe you don't really need that. And so I think we'll see more of that kind of blended household thing of where like, yeah, we have this big vehicle for this stuff. Right. Probably an electric because I don't think gas makes a lot of sense on Hawaii. Uh, and then also we've got these smaller little things that we use to do other things that we need to mm -hmm. do. And I think that's where a lot of a lot of things go. And then there's a second movement afoot, which is a lot of suburbs are rethinking what it is to be a suburb. You know, the 15 minute city movement and so forth is not right. just an urban thing. It's also happening in suburbs where they're saying, well, wait a minute, it'd be really cool if we had access to X, Y and Z resource here in the community instead of having to drive to the city proper to get it. And I think that as land values exceeding or continue to change. As density continues to increase, we will see more addition of amenities to suburbs that will require less transportation. And then finally, the last piece that goes without saying, but I'll say it, is public transit. And public transit is a key right. backbone for all of the above. You know, you've got the bus that needs to expand. You've got, in many cases, trains and other things that could be added. That's obviously there are challenges in Hawaii and everywhere with adding certain things, cost, politics, land, topography, et cetera. But if you start putting all those pieces together and I live in a suburb and I have access to the bus and or some other thing, plus small little vehicles for my daily use, plus occasionally a car, maybe it's a shared car, maybe it's an owned car. Right. That, I think that's where this kind of all heads for suburbs as well as the cities. And frankly, we can't leave behind the suburbs or the small towns and the rural areas. Like all of this stuff has to still help those folks move too because they have the same needs. Uh, their needs are gonna be different and the form factors may serve them differently. The business models may need to change. But at the end of the day, everybody needs to move. And so we've got to figure that out. Absolutely. One of the things at the conference that I was I didn't know about was uh, and the McKinsey folks were talking about uh, what I guess they're going to call mini mobility, which is not micro mobility, but is 
the uh, these two or three and four wheel uh, little bitty uh, kind of bubbles of of uh, that kind of solve the weather problem, which uh, in Seattle would be a problem, and even in Hawaii it can can be a problem and can increase the safety and increase the the carrying capacity. And and uh, for a lot of of uh, trips, they would be just. Uh, just fine, little you know, kind of. If I get if if my building gets a, a a charge spot someday soon, my condo, I'll, I'll give I'm get myself a smart electric an electric smart car. Uh, but you know, these things look like smart cars that somebody let half the air out of, and uh, they're they're smaller, but they're you know uh, they have capacity for two, maybe three people. They have capacity for groceries, the things that everybody uses on a daily basis. So I I, I think. Uh, there's huge promise there. Yeah, I agree. I think it's an exciting area. Lots of yeah. growth. And going back to what you said before about your uh, your your startup in in Europe, uh, you know, there is one uh, pizza company. I'll shout them out because Domino Pizza here in Hawaii delivers mm-hmm. most or many of their pizzas on electric uh, bikes. But yeah. uh, I, I know that UPS and FedEx and those guys have looked at. Uh, electric bike, uh, you know, pulled or electric bike driven uh, delivery for that, la- you know, the last mile. And and in Hawaii, the last mile may be the whole mile because the whole way, because things are pretty close. I mean, to have all these big, huge FedEx trucks rolling around downtown, uh, it's not, it, it can't be, uh, you know, the economic way to go about it when you can get, you know, the airport is, is 15 minutes away, you get everything on to 20 of those little guys and, and get them out there. So I'm, I'm waiting for UPS or FedEx or, uh, you know, the uh, the lab services that are always delivering uh, blood samples and all that sort of thing back and forth from the lab to their various offices. All of those could be electric and could easily, uh, you know, survive the the range, mo- range anxiety because if things are that close. Yep. Yeah, I think, Hawaii and Honolulu specifically is an amazing opportunity for micromobility. And I, I mean that owned, shared, leased, you name it, all the different ways you can access these things. If you think about it, it is almost the perfect place. It has it has relative, uh, I'm, let's focus specifically on Honolulu. I acknowledge not all of the islands look like this, but yeah. here you have a city that's the vast majority of the population, which is in many cases relatively flat. Not all of it. There's some really serious hills, but e-bikes flattened hills in a lot of cases. Right. Distances, are, distances aren't super great. The cost of importing diesel and petroleum is just off the hook, right? It's yeah. it's very expensive to drive a gas car there, which is why electric cars make sense. But even better, it costs even less to charge an e-bike or an e-scooter or an e-cargo bike or a very small footprint e- e-car of some sort, EV. So it's got, it's got weather that cooperates much of the time for something like this if you are uncovered. It's got topography that in many cases is friendly. It's got economic reasons. You want to cut the costs, stop paying for gas every day. You know, like it's it's got some amazing things. And then currently it's got crazy congestion. H1, every time I've been on it, seems to be backed up. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you can just start displacing some of that traffic onto smaller, lighter electric vehicles, you can take up a lot less space. And then finally, of course, there is the issue of space. And if we're still talking about Honolulu, you've got space for placing cars, right? You, especially if you're in the downtown or Waikiki or wherever, there, there isn't a ton of space. There's not, you're not going to go underground with deep parking garages the way you might on the mainland. So um, I think Honolulu creates an amazing opportunity for this stuff to really take off. Uh, and then that doesn't even touch health benefits of things like more active mobility and so forth. So I think that, that there's just so many good reasons why micromobility and light electric vehicles can be a real boon for Hawaii. So if you and I were going to pool our, uh, you know, our resources here, whatever you've got in your wallet and whatever I've got in my wallet, mm. we'll, we'll, you know, and we're going to do this for Honolulu. If you want, we can talk about okay. Seattle, but I'm, I okay. want to talk about Honolulu. What would we, what would we want to see here? What would we want to have uh, come here that would take advantage of all these, you know, these things are so natural and obvious and yet, you know, stuff doesn't happen at least fast enough for us. What would we what would we wish to see here? What would we hope for? Well, Peter, if I can actually if I can wish, I'm gonna go go big. Go so, big, so you know, my same, wish. same same cost. The price is Great. the same whether you go big or stay home. Absolutely. My my wish then in this case is H dot and DTS, the city and county all work together and say, okay, we're gonna create a, a large innovation area. And we're going to make it really easy to permit and pilot any number of technologies from mobility in that area. Let's say that it's 
Kaka'ako to Waikiki downtown up to U of H or something like that. Right. So you've got that area, maybe Kalihi as well. It's like, let's spread it a little bit further and say, okay, it's going to be really easy to permit and operate in here. We're going to prioritize new devices over the existing stuff. We're going to take out some parking spaces and allocate them for parking so we can get parking right. Because we can all agree the way parking has happened, in fact, Lime's pilot there, call it what you will, Lime's launch there, parking was a huge problem, right? They just get left places. So let's build that infrastructure in a very quick sandbox kind of way. We're not doing this forever. We're going to try it out and see what we can learn, see what we can have happen here. We're going to have a time-limited sort of trial. We're going to pull in a whole bunch of really interesting partners from all over the world, take the best of breed, best practices, have an open application period to come in the sandbox. We're going to launch it. We're going to run it for X period of time, and we're going to see what we can learn at the end of it. Then we can make some informed decisions. Honolulu could be the like the most amazing innovation hub for that kind of a pilot. And I would love to see that happen. So if you give me that wish, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I officially grant you that wish on behalf of the two wheel revolution. Uh, we'll have to see about the other folks who we have to get on board for this. So this, is, this has been fascinating. I think we need to go on for another, uh, you know, I could go on for a lot more time, time to tap your brain because I think you really are out there on the, the front lines of, of making this happen for, uh, the companies and ultimately for the people that they're going to serve, everybody that's going to ride your, you know, the devices that you help support through Elemental Accelerator, through your advice, obviously through the money that you're able to give them. But I think probably the advice is uh, as valuable, if not more valuable, somebody that's been in the in the trenches with companies like Lime and uh, Super Pedestrian and others. So I, I would love to go on. We're going to uh, we're going to end it here. Maybe uh, come back in the future. We can talk again. I will ask one more question, and that is, uh, I know you go to these conferences like Micro Mobility America, and I, I don't know if you're going to go to Amsterdam. I, I can't, but I would love to. Is that the way you find new uh, the innovations, or do they come to you, or how does that work? Yes. <laughs> All of those okay. things. All of those things. Constantly reading, go to places that people are doing things, talking to people like you and others who are are paying attention and care, listening to podcasts, reading blogs, you name it. There's a world full of information, and I think the wow. the challenge is really filtering through it all. All right, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell anybody how to get your job, but I wish there were more of more of you out there. So thank you so much, Gabriel. I really appreciate it. It's been fascinating for me and I'm sure for, uh, you know, for my six dedicated viewers. And we're going to get this uh, show out on the, on, on the various platforms because I think there's really something, especially for the people in Honolulu who are in a position to make a difference uh, on some of these issues you've raised to, to get that out there. Well, thank so, you, Peter. Stick around for a minute. I'm going to do this is the micro mobility moment. I try to end every show with something. Uh, sometimes it's weird and wacky from the world of of uh, uh, of micro mobility. Sometimes it's a bit more serious. Uh, we'll get this up on the screen and we'll go to the the picture. Um, and this is the uh, um, a ride that was organized by the Hawaii Bicycling League a couple of weeks ago. Now it's called the Zach uh, Zach's Ride for Safe Streets. Young man named Zachary Minago, about 10 years, exactly 10 years ago, was out bicycling with friends. He was a graduate of local high school and he was at Hawaii Pacific University and a hit and run driver killed him. And uh, they eventually caught the guy and he he paid for it, but that doesn't restore a life. So the Hawaii Bicycle Committee every year does Zach's ride for safety. You can see here uh, a group uh, of the many people that took part, uh, old, young, all kinds of bicycles uh, over on the left side there. I see a, a folding bike that I once had one of. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's the U Bicycling League is a great institution and it is, um, you know, they're really out there uh, walking the walk. And to somewhat to your point, uh, we they they're supporting a bill in the legislature now, which would allow the Department of Transportation to make certain kinds of changes like bike lanes and putting in uh, bike stands and things like that without going through the entire process of permitting and everything like that, which now, you know, takes up a lot of time for what are really kind of very minor kinds of improvements. And so I'm going to end on the next slide, which is something we, we came up last week, but uh, it just shows this is the you know, these are the numbers that were reported last month. We also just kicked off a, 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 a rebate, an e-bike rebate program here uh, by, you know, that was led by one of our legislators. So uh, it's happening. The number of e-bikes out on the street is bigger than ever. 
And uh, so, um, you know, it's definitely happening. The two wheel revolution isn't coming, it's here. And I thank you, Gabriel Shear and all of the Elemental Accelerator. I thank all our viewers and uh, I'll see you next time. Aloha. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate having me. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.